Hello. Today is Monday, November 9th, 2020. My name is Carlo Bird, and I'm interviewing Juan Livas for the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Livas, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at the UT Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you do want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Um, because we are conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree, after each one. There are two questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. Voces wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs and other documentation, at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voces. Do you give Voces consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes. Awesome. Do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes. Awesome. Um, do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Awesome. Um, we have many questions in a pre-interview form that we already filled out. We use that inf information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voices server. Before we send it to the Benson, we, should we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or any family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available? Let me reread that question. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes, that's fine. Awesome. On occasion, Voices receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and that concludes our preamble. Um, to get into it, um, I'd like to start off by asking you, Juan, um, I like how, Tell me about yourself and uh, your history. Um, uh, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but... Uh, as far uh, as you'd like, um, I guess to start off, uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Yeah, born and raised in Laredo, Texas, which is a border town here in South Texas. Um, lived here most of my life, uh, except for about three years when I went to San Antonio for my master's to UTSA. But yeah, born and raised in Laredo, Texas. Uh, we moved around a lot growing up, you know, just from apartment. Um, um, didn't think uh, life on the border was any different than any other place until you actually go outside the border. Like when I went to San Antonio, you know, you get to see, you know, uh, when I went to San Antonio during that time was the whole uh, quote unquote, a uh, drug war in Nuevo Laredo. Um, so even going to San Antonio, people assumed whenever I say, oh, I'm from Laredo, they thought the violence was in Laredo too. So they would ask, oh, are you okay? How are you down there, you know, with the shooting and the grenades and all that? You know, assuming that what's happening in Mexico was still happening in Laredo since it's on the border. Um, yeah, so born and raised in Laredo. Uh, 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 I have two brothers, uh, one sister, I'm the youngest. Um, uh, graduated high school, went to community college in Laredo. Uh, I looked at different options, you know, as far as going out, just like everybody else, go out of town, stay in Laredo, went to Laredo Community College at that time. Now it's Laredo College. Um, after that, uh, transferred again, you know, went to TAMU. And then um, uh, as far as uh, going to my graduate studies, um, you know, I, I, I thought of about, you know, UNT and other places, but UTSA felt the one that most um, um, offered me the most opportunity and was seemed the most interested in me. So, you know, as, as great as the other places may have been, or, you know, I'm sure they were probably an awesome experience as well. You know, I thought, you know, uh, the best decision was to go to the place that, you know, seemed most interested and also provided the same uh, opportunities I was looking for at that time. Um, um, let's see what else. Um, I think uh, that's it. I don't know what else to to share. Um, as far yeah, yeah. as um, oh. in high school, I'm asked, that's when I started just getting active with UIO and other stuff and volunteering in places. Um, and little did I know, uh, fast forward, I guess more than fifteen, maybe twenty years later, that I would still be um, 
volunteering or being active in the community. So I, I guess that started back in high school in the in the UIO and the Kiwanis Cup at that time and whatnot. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing all that. Mm -hmm. And um, with that in mind, what is your current occupation uh, to share with Voces? Sure. So currently, I uh, for the past, I believe, going on 10 years, I work with the United Independent School District, which is the school district in Laredo, Texas, um, with their after school program. I'm currently, the official title is Community, community Partnership Officer. Um, basically, the right to people to get a grasp of it. It's, it's a big program. We oversee 25 elementary campuses, over 250 staff. Um, so the best way I, so people can get concept is think of it as a school. Um, we have the principal, which is my boss, and then I would be the assistant principal. So I guess I'm like the assistant principal of the UIC after school program, um, which is basically, you know, uh, what it sounds like, uh, training staff, um, uh, handing any parent concerns, any concerns with the students may have, uh, bringing in activities, percentage from the community to present to the kids. Right now, it's gone virtual, you know, we have to adapt. So we're doing virtual camps, uh, one hour from four to five every day, and, you know, Elementary kids log on and they listen to to presenters, um, you know, uh, you know, from anything from the Laredo Heat to Laredo Public Library to Risk to you know, uh, Time U. Uh, just talk to kids about what they do. Um, so that's been my main job. Aside outside from you know little uh, jobs I've been contracted for, but my main job has been that for going on ten years. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. And with um, that in mind, the virtual uh, shift. Um, how did you first learn about COVID-19 uh, and when did you realize it was serious? Um, I mean, I pretty much keep up with current events, whether it's the, the news, like actual TV news, whether it's a, a podcast I listen to like NPR or, you know, the newspaper, um, um, Facebook, like everybody else nowadays, uh, not just Facebook, but, you know, on top of the other things I mentioned, but um, so, you know, just like everybody else, I, I guess I heard about, you know, January, you know, happening in, 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 in other places and then slowly creeping up here. Um, uh, we're trying to follow, you know, as far as the, how serious it was, you know, it kept increasing, increasing. And then us, again, working in the school district setting, um, keep an eye on that. My wife is a teacher as well. She teaches fifth grade. Uh, she's been there for going on 10 years now as well. So we we're paying close attention. You know, we also have um, nieces, nephews, our family, our friends have kids. So we were tracking it, you know, uh, listening, you know, to whatever they told us, to, you know, uh, the guidelines to follow. And then eventually um, they got to, of course, the, the, the like everybody else, the, the lockdown and, and um, it hit us once uh, the school district um, around spring break, at least with us in mid-March, they told us, you know, we're going we're we're to take a week. And then a week turned into two weeks, and then you know it turned out to be the whole um, the rest of the semester. So uh, when it got to that point, that's when we knew it was something serious. Uh, we really went out. At least us, you know, I know everybody else reacted, but my wife and I really didn't really go out that much the first two, three, four months. Um, and now, even so, uh, we recently have a uh, since September 29th, a newborn baby girl. So uh, now even more recent for us to be cautious. Um, um, you know, of each other and who who um, uh, visits our house and everything. Oh, wow. Um, so you had a, a, a child in the age of COVID? Yes, it's just born September 29th. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, how was that, uh, the hospital process, uh, the birthing process around COVID? Um, well, it was, it was, I mean, we're grateful, first of all, that, that everything came out fine, you know, um, uh, that, that uh, you know, she's healthy, my wife, uh, for, for the most part, came out healthy, fine. Um, it was a little bit hard because I got to go to the first doctor appointment with the OBGYN, but then COVID hit, and Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Roberto Gonzalez, he, he turned out to be the, the one that's also handling the the COVID area in one of the hospitals, Laredo Medical Center in Laredo. So his, uh, and I'm sure the rest were his restrictions were kind of, uh, you know, in place. So that would be the, I know that would be the last time I'll go with my wife. So it was kind of hard um, from an emotional standpoint, like I would have to, I would drop her off during my lunch hour after work or before work. And, and you know, she would tell me, oh, I got to the sonogram and everything, but um, unfortunately, you know, uh, only, only the patient, which in this case, the, the mom, 
was allowed to go and out the husband. Um, but you know, everything kept fine, fine, fine. Then the hospital stay came around. Luckily come September, late September, which was of course September 29th, um, it, it, it wasn't, at least here at the LMC, it wasn't as bad already. I'm, I've heard, you know, stories that in the springtime and summertime, they're very, you know, uh, strict. But it seemed when, when we were there, um, you know, I got to be with her in the same room and stuff. And of course, we had to wear the face masks and, and, and all that. But um, it, it was mostly just us. Uh, you know, our moms couldn't be there, our sisters, you know. But it was just her and I, and then the baby was born, and, and she was fine. And, and um, uh, we had to get tested a couple of days before um, the, the hospital stayed just to make sure. And we came up, of course, negative. Um, but it, it was uh, it was uh, interesting. It was trying a trying time, uh, especially emotionally, for our families as well. You know, uh, um, you know, whenever there's a newborn, whether it's a boy, or girl, or twins, you know, the grandmas, the tias want to you know hold her and hug her, but um, we just ask them to bear with us and be patient and you know be understanding of the situation we're in. Thank you for sharing that experience. Uh, I'm glad it went smooth. Yeah, it must be hard not being able to you know carry that other aspect of, of love. It's hard in the virtual world in the age of a pandemic. I appreciate you sharing that experience. And um, with COVID still in mind, uh, did you contract uh, COVID-19 at all or anyone in your family? No, no, uh, they were as far as we know, no, we've all been fortunate, um, especially that some of our, our um, family, uh, our, our family that works, you know, in certain types of jobs, you know, we've been fortunate to, to open up. Um, fine uh, yeah so yeah we're lucky uh, we, we do know uh friends or friend of a friend that, that's gotten it and some have passed away too but um you know we've been fortunate oh i see i see um have you had any personal connections uh um lose your life to covid um no i mean besides uh co-workers you know and of course you know it's hard when, because you know at work you get to know people you know even if it's on the same department, we see them every day, um, or um, not close but distant relatives. But you still, you know, know from you know family gatherings. So you, you still wish them the best. Um, and then you see on Facebook, um, you know, you you log in one day and one of your friends makes a post. You know, take it seriously because my dad just passed away to COVID. Um, you know, someone was posting, you know, I, I'm in I'm quarantining right now, so I can't see you guys. So that's when it hits you, you know. I know everybody has a different um, perspective on it, but as far as uh, my wife and I go, you know, we, we're taking it seriously and, and we're, uh, we feel for those that have lost uh, someone or, or have been quarantined or, you know, uh, going through a tough time. No, yeah, yeah, it's definitely been tough. Um, thank you for sharing that. I feel that, um, you know, this, the virtual world has really helped us grasp the severity and how close it is to us. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, um, what have been the methods of communication for you and your family or your friends? Um, it's been uh, uh, text, uh, uh, text, phone calls, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, you know, um, uh, very rarely, you know, at, at least not with us, you know, we rarely do the virtual like uh, stuff. Um, we have a, our, our house has a like a glass, partial glass door. So we did the whole, we adapted, you know, so uh, my wife and I were like by the door with the baby and then, you know, some of our, our family, you know, was on the opposite. So it's kind of like looking through a glass, glass window in a way. Um, but yeah, mostly just uh, um, texting, communicating uh, through WhatsApp and we have a messenger. We check in on each other, you know, how are you doing? How's everything going? Um, trying to um, make sure we're, we're fine mentally as well. Yeah, that definitely does seem to be the new normal for a lot of folks, um, you know, having to adapt, you know, with texting to, to grandma, like that's something completely new for folks and, you know, yes. fascinating. Um, I and I'm glad, uh, I was going to say, <clears throat> Rook, uh, we talked about this uh, during the summer, like the one positive, I guess, of when this pandemic happened was <clears throat> they happen right now that we have all this uh, technology, like texting and I mean if this was 20 years ago we would have had to do like emails or letters you know but fortunately now we have like uh the virtual settings and whatsapp and cell phones are more common so no yeah definitely uh being the modern age has definitely facilitated mm -hmm. 
a lot of this, like especially this interview, you know, we're on, we're on Zoom. Yes. And um, I wanted to get into Laredo. Um, I would like your perspective on the border town. How would you describe it? Um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a place that's very uh, uh, cultural as far as, you know, <clears throat> from both the, the American and Mexican, its roots, uh, it's very family oriented. Um, <clears throat> without getting into, I mean, yes, you have the people with different political beliefs and, and, and social economic backgrounds, but no matter what your social income is, what your political belief is, I think the one thing that people have in common here is they're very close knit with families and close. Um, the, my friends have noticed and I've noticed Laredo's like one city where you, you could be driving around during the week and you smell like someone cooking out. You could just smell in the air like it could be Wednesday night and someone's cooking out or, or you know Thursday afternoon and someone's cooking out. Um, it's a it's a bordered city that just like other border cities it, it still has work to, to do as far as um, uh, the type of jobs it brings. Um, educational attainment, the dropout rate, poverty, you know. Uh, so as far as those factors, we still have work to do. Um, our voter turnout was the highest since 1988, uh, but it was still about 49, 50%. So it's still good, we're getting there. Um, so hopefully we'll get more people politically active um, to make, to bring those changes, you know, to, to, to our border city, as far as, you know, education, as far as the type of jobs we have. Um, Laredo College just, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you might have to double check me on this. I don't know if it was just in Texas was the most affordable uh, college. Uh, I don't know if it was in the state or in the nation, but I think this was just like a few weeks ago it was announced. So, I mean, uh, that opportunity we have, you know, that our community college is affordable and, and perhaps a great uh, education for people, you know, it, you get a cost effective education to get your credits before you transfer out. Um, it could be conservative at times, you know, with religion and, and, and uh, immigration, um, but it, it's still, uh, uh, well, we, we all care about family uh, at the end of the day. I think that's one thing that unites us, um, uh, no matter your belief, no matter, you know, your income, is you can tell that's one common thread. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, and what are the people <clears throat> like? Do you feel they vary by area in Laredo? Yeah, like most most cities, yeah, you have the the north uh, area, you have the 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 um, the mines, the quote unquote mines road, which is called just like the northwest side, which is like the warehouses and residential. You have the south, and now it's it's grown. I mean, just the past thirty years, twenty years, it's grown. It's grown like you see more subdivisions, you see more business, you know, more restaurant chains coming here. I mean, it, it's definitely grown. Um, our downtown has grown, you know, the nightlife has grown in the past even two or three years. Um, um, but you could tell, you know, um, which uh, part gets the more, more um, uh, resources. Um, definitely, if you look at the, what divides Laredo as far as the highway, I-35, uh, is in my opinion, west of I-35, because they run north to south, so west of I-35, uh, it's in my opinion, uh, they don't have the same resources as the other side of the highway. West 35, uh, which is south and northwest, the mines, um, they don't have a, a, a hospital. Uh, they don't have even the two hospitals, LMC and Doctors Hospital. Uh, they've opened up branches, uh, you know, they were ER branches. Uh, they opened them in South Laredo, North, but there isn't a branch in the west side uh, of Laredo. Um, there's no big of the big um, chains like HB, Target, Walmart. They only have one Walmart there. Um, so whereas goes to the other side of the highway has, you know, a whole lot of Walmarts, Targets, HBs. Um, so it's trying to get better with the, as far as uh, family life, it's getting better with as far as making libraries, library branches, public library branches. Um, parks, so uh, we're getting there, we're progressing as far as getting better as far as providing that, um, but we still have a ways to go. Um, you know, it is of course the west side of Laredo, so we, um, I would dare say, you know, it's also like lower as far as 
income and education goals. But that shouldn't be a reason that that side doesn't get the same resources that the other side of the highway gets. And, you know, that perspective, I wanted to know, um, it, it, <clears throat> the side is, is closest to the border. And um, that's just something I, I know that, that Laredo has grown from the border up, you know, to the north and on. And um, it, it's interesting because uh, historians have noted that I-35 has segregated cities uh, across Texas like that. They say mm -hmm. the same for Austin. You know, East Austin is um, a cultural hub of minorities, but extremely underfunded, you know, as some would say, West Laredo. So just something that I thought was interesting to, in the comparison. Yeah. And with that in mind, what's the landscape like? How do people get around? As far as like everyday life, like to work and, and school or? Um, it's, it's, I mean, mostly uh, it bus and trans uh, the own personal vehicle. Um, I know in the past few years, and I've seen it, well, you could see it with driving around the bike trails and the bike lanes. So we're trying to get more of those, um, you know, to encourage that, you know, walking, running, uh, bicycling uh, type of transportation. Um, but we, I, I remember a few years ago, with the Laredo uh, uh, master plan, uh, they brought someone to the Laredo Public Library and his recommendation was, uh, you guys have, in some areas, you guys have big white streets, you know? So one solution he was saying was reduce the white streets, you know, you can make two lanes there or you could add a bike lane, you know, why do you need this white street where you could fit a bike lane into? Uh, you know, you, you need, we need more sidewalks, he was saying, you know, you, again, you have, a, you have white streets, but, what if you, you cut a bit of the street and add a sidewalk? Um, and I think that's what I've slowly seen what we're working on it. I hope we do, because uh, I think we definitely need to be a more quote unquote walkable uh, city, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, walking, jo jogging, running, um, you know, uh, I, would, uh, I know where I live, we have now a two mile um, trail, which is great. I know I've used it and I've seen people use it, which is a great site to see, but those should be all over Laredo. And I know they've tried to build some that connect from the North Laredo all the way to South Laredo, which is awesome. That way people could bicycle. And, and I have friends that actually do bike it, you know, they bicycle from North and it'll be the South or vice versa, so. That's awesome to hear. And, you know, um, what is the demographic like? Uh, you know, what is Laredo, uh, what's the, you know, geographic makeup or the, what do you call it? Uh, it's still about 95% or more uh, quote unquote Hispanic, or, you know, or, or, or Mexican American or Latino, whatever term you want to use. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're other, other quote unquote races, uh, but 95% is, is mostly Mexican Hispanic uh, city. And uh, I didn't notice it until I went to San Antonio, and, and that was what I like the experience is, um, is you get that experience from other cultures and races. Um, that's what I loved about my experience in, in UTC. Like, you know, you go from a city that's 95% Hispanic to a place that's more diverse. So you learn more about uh, different, you know, people with different backgrounds. Um, and that was just a great experience, you know, to, to have, you know, and you get to experience another world, you know. Um, and learn, learn about their culture and you know what, what they do and, and, and where they, they come from. Um, and I, I like to say Laredo is not uh, quote unquote uh, racist because of course they're mostly one race, uh, but it's more um, uh, uh, like social economic, more on how much it, people judge you more on how much you earn. You know, that's interesting to know, uh, you know, that how because uh, that's a common theme. Um, a lot of Laredoans who do uh, seek out college, they come back and they share the same experience that, you know, Laredo is its own little world, some might mm -hmm. say, with how it's just just Latinos who are in between Nova Laredo and parts of Texas. Um, so it's just fascinating. And I want to share real quick, uh, I, I tell my friends the story of uh, the language here is to, I guess, again, because of the makeup, you know, the high, you know, uh, you know, um, is my, my, my theory, you know, since I'm mostly uh, Mexican and Hispanic, um, you go to a restaurant or fast food place and, and some people, you know, uh, they're, they're Spanish dominant. Or, or if you don't know Spanish, uh, my friends have told me, or, you know, that 
they have a tough time communicating because they don't know Spanish and the server or the person helping them or the employee, you know, only know Spanish. So there's that language barrier at times in Laredo. And I went to, when I was in San Antonio, when I just moved up there, I went to, of course, a baker, you know, to get my pan dulce, my conchas and, and whatnot. And I ordered it in Spanish. And then when the lady uh, rang me up, you know, um, she, she rang me up and everything, but uh, she talked to me in English the whole time. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if she could uh, see it in my face or not, but me, at least on the inside, I was just taken aback. Like, uh, uh, usually when I go to bakeries in Laredo, they always, they always talk to you in Spanish. So it was like a, something new, like, oh, wow, like, I'm in a bakery, so it's, you know, contrast and all that. And the lady's talking to me uh, uh, in English. Yeah, almost like a cultural clash, you know, like saying conchas. Yeah, exactly. And I have yeah. some conchas instead of, you know, in, in Spanish. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing that. And uh, going back a little into Laredo, um, what's the leadership in Laredo like? Could you describe that? Uh, as far as politics, the leadership? Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. mostly a, a Democrat, uh, quote unquote, Democrat um, um, uh, city as far as the, the people, uh, you know, uh, I mean, for city council, we don't really have to declare uh, a political affiliation, but for, for the rest, um, I know some people say they're only Democrat on paper and, you know, that they, they could have Republican beliefs, but since, you know, it's hard to run as a Republican in Laredo, which I saw this, you know, every election, even with the most recent one last week, um, even if you have Republican beliefs, some people may run, oh, well, I'm just gonna run as a Democrat because people just see Republicans like, nope, <laughs> won't, you know. Even though uh, I find it uh, interesting how, even though um, uh, we have at least our population, you know, have, you know, when it comes to religion or, or, or taxes, you know, you could argue we have more of a conservative uh, thought process, but we still vote for Democrat candidates. So it's that little um, twist on it. But it, it's, it's a, as far as leadership um, at the county or city level, just like unfortunately, just like with other cities, including border cities, there's always allegations of uh, corruption, misusage of funds, you know, why do you see money for this? Um, I know at city council, it got big that I believe it was last year, recently, um, they just uh, gave themselves uh, retirement benefits. And now they have each, each one of them has, um, half a million dollars in uh, uh, discretionary funds to use at their you know, discretion. So I know, I know obviously there's some people, you know, like why do you need a retirement benefits? Why do you need half a million? Um, so of course there's that uh, lack of trust in elected officials. And you see like over the years, things don't change. Going back to what I said earlier, you know, the jobs we have, education, poverty, the standard of living. Um, so people become, uh, they lose faith in the system, they lose faith in elected officials. Uh, Paquet Voto, it's hard the same thing, or, you know, it's hard the same people. And at times you're right, you know, it's hard the same uh, people or families um, that get elected. But um, I'm glad, going back to, I know it's only 49, 50%, but I'm glad it, the highest percentage-wise since 1988, I hope it increases with the next 2022, 2024 elections. I hope it's a sign that we're trending upward as far as uh, becoming politically involved, because um, that's a, that's the currently that's the system we have, and that's the system voting's the way to make change under this current system we have. So hopefully, uh, we realize that, and now we're still people. I know we're, you know, and and I did my best. You know, I know everybody did. My friends and I like go on Facebook and go out and vote. I know you know, especially in Laredo and everywhere else. Um, you're working two jobs, uh, you're, work, you're going to school full-time and working late, uh, you're a single mom, you're a single parent, you know, but it's finding that time to, to know that your vote matters and, and by voting, you, you're, you're saying that I want things to change. Um, so it's just like, I guess it's us trying to break through and have people understand like, I know you're busy and I know it's tough, like, you know, I know like you get home tired and all that, but just the power you have, you know, just by, just by voting, you know, uh, so. Yeah, yeah, really um, putting up those stakes for people, uh, realizing that the stakes are high so they can uh, participate in their civic duty. 
And um, with a political aspect in mind, um, how did Laredo react to the Trump administration? <clears throat> well, it depends who you ask. I mean, of course, it's a conservative, given that it uh, has a lot of government jobs, uh, Border Patrol, Customs, uh, ICE, et cetera. Um, there's people who, you know, through my work, through uh, the nonprofit Laredo, Laredo Immigrant Alliance and, and other, you know, the No Border Walk Coalition, uh, we've seen, uh, if it wasn't apparent before, it was apparent with, during this, I mean, this current administration, which is, as we know, about to, to end in a couple of months, um, that Laredo's a conservative town um, and they're, they're conservative, including with the immigration. Um, and some are for the wall, like, you know, build the wall, like even though it might be a uh, misuse of funds, so why do you need so much money for a wall? Or, or you know, uh, with this amount, you know, you, you could hire X amount of agents, you know, and still building a wall, you know, people are still pro wall, even though it's gonna go through neighborhoods and schools and the river and parks. Um, so even I have, I have a family, you know, cousins, friends who are, uh, both conservative and some who are even, not all, but even some who are also conservative and Trump supporters, um, whether it's because of his uh, thoughts on uh, economics, um, immigration, and of course, you have the single issue voters, which the most important thing is abortion. Um, if they're against abortion, you know, they got my vote, regardless of everything else, as long as, you know, the single issue voters, like, you know, whatever that issue may be. Um, so it it did, I think it, it made Laredo more active. You saw a lot more groups like Laredo Immigrant Alliance, No Border Walk Coalition, uh, and others uh, uh, rise up and uh, out of this administration because of the policies. So people here uh, decide, you know, we need to do something. We need to bring awareness to these policies and, you know, uh, educate the community and engage them, you know, and tell them, hey, this is what's happening. This is why um, it shouldn't be happening. Um, so you saw a lot more activism. And on the other end, you saw uh, the Republican Party here in Webb County, at least, become a lot more active as well and vocal. Um, so it, you could say it both ways. It, it, it made, um, I guess it made people more active, whether you're on the uh, for Trump or against Trump, for his policies, against his policies it made people become more active and more vocal. I see. And um, you mentioned your activism, which is perfect because I do want to talk about that. <laughs> um, you know, how did, or could you mention those organizations again? And um, how did you get involved with them? Um, uh, uh, well, I don't know which ones you, you want me to mention. There's so many. <laughs> <this time. laughs> yes. Uh, so you brought up the No Border Wall Coalition and the Immigration Alliance? The Right Immigrant Alliance. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Laredo Immigrant Alliance uh, started up, I believe it's going on three years. Um, you know, uh, Facebook, I saw a couple of friends interested in events. It was a Saturday. They were meeting at Holden Institute, which is a great community center or, or there by Santa Maria Street by uh, Washington, Santa Maria. Um, and it was a Saturday a, a few years ago and they're going to meet, you know, let's, you know, let's meet up, let's have a powwow, discuss what's going on with these policies by, by our president and how we could, you know, bring awareness. Um, so, you know, of course, I was at another event, but I, you know, I decided, well, let me take the time um, and check it out, which I did. I went, um, and since then, I've stayed involved, you know, as best as I can. Um, um, it, 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 it started with people who have DACA status. So, of course, they're, um, they want to start because at that time was when Trump uh, uh, wanted to enter the, the program, um, DACA. So that, that was their reason to get involved and wanted to start doing something. And now it's like, you know, hey, I know people who are undocumented, you know, uh, I'm sure most people in the room are someone that's undocumented. So, uh, and I didn't agree with the policies and the way uh, their administration was going about it. So um, I've been involved ever since. We've had rallies, vigils, uh, marches, press releases, press conferences, DACA clinics, which means helping people renew their DACA paperwork. Um, so we've been going on, I believe, three years, and it's still going. Um, I know we're going to have a new president, President Biden, but, you know, uh, I always tell people, and, and you know, I'm, I'm bipartisan on, on issues, 
uh, both Democrats and Republicans, you know, haven't done much on immigration and, you know, policies and, and both sides are responsible. You know, of course, Obama with the deport deportation. So uh, I'm sure that the Red Immigrant Alliance, uh, I don't uh, speak fully for them, but I'm sure that with Biden still, you know, we're not going to be like, oh, he won, Trump is gone, you know, let's ease back. You know, we still have to hold our elected officials accountable um, and and advocate for 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 for, for uh, people and empower people um, to speak up for themselves. Uh, no Border Walk Coalition started uh, around the time that um, uh, President Trump declared the national emergency, more or less around that time, which was, I believe, uh, 2019, I believe. Um, it was a group, different groups that came together, each with their own vested, uh, each with their own interest and reason, you know, and, and that's why I called a coalition because, you know, it was, the Duke Grande Transfer Study Center, Lord Immigrant Alliance at that time, moved Texas as well. Cesar Chavez Memorial Alliance, LULAC, one of the LULAC chapters, um, uh, uh, um, Sisters of Mercy, um, uh, landowners uh, who are actually going to be affected by the wall. And it just kept growing and growing, you know, lawyers with, the, with an interest they want to advocate for, for, for uh, being against the wall. Um, and since then, we've had, uh, you know, We've tried, we've seen, you know, you know uh, people have come and gone, groups have come and gone, but, you know, it's still maintained the same goal, which is uh, uh, to not have the wall be built in, in Webb County. We've seen what's happening in other, unfortunately, in the Valley and other places, you know, it's been a sad sight to see. And we're glad that people are on that part, uh, on those areas are also advocating, you know, and protesting in their own, in their own methods, you know, and we do keep that collaboration going and help amplify amplify each other's uh, efforts. Um, but as far as us here in Webb County, our thing was like, it hasn't started, the contracts haven't uh, uh, been awarded, uh, you know, at that time, um, you know, the construction hasn't started. So our thing was, uh, we just stop it before it starts here. Um, what one of the, for the past few months, our goal is basically uh, cancel, uh, delay and cancel, uh, delay and cancel, delay and cancel. You know, at least, and let's hope uh, Trump uh, uh, loses the win election. Biden, once he gets elected, which he, as we found out this past weekend, he did. So now, at, us as a coalition, just like with the Immigrant Alliance, we need to hold this administration uh, accountable and make sure, hey, uh, we need to make that official that you're not going to build the wall. You know, not none of this like, well, you know. So <clears throat> we still have work to do as far as you know. Um, making sure that the water doesn't come to Webb County and hopefully in other places that it could also be stopped along the border. Uh, for reasons I said earlier, you know, um, it, it's not the right, it's not the right solution uh, for uh, the immigration issues that we've had uh, in the past and current. I see, yeah, and um, you mentioned also the RGISC, the Rio Grande International mm -hmm. Science Center. Um, what is their role in the, uh, in the fight against the border wall? Oh, well, they play a huge role. They're basically, I, I guess, uh, um, you know, it, it, they act as a quote unquote, the fiscal sponsor of the coalition, you know, handing the finances and, you know, so, uh, uh, any donations we get, you know, and, and the budget, uh, basically. And <clears throat> their interest is, of course, the was going to affect the, the river, the Rio Grande, which is one of the 10 most endangered rivers in the whole world, um, you know, and that we always try to tell people it's it's not in the Webb County, it's not in Texas, it's not in the country, but in the whole world, it's still, unfortunately, you know, for their reason, you know, uh, and that's something else we need to work on with, with Mexico, uh, getting us off that top 10 list, um, uh, infamous, I guess, top 10 list. And um, so it will, it will affect the Rio Grande, um, our only water, water source for drinking water, and uh, you know, also, I mean, we're an environmental organization. So uh, to see all these uh, numerous, you know, environmental laws being waived by the current Trump administration just to build this wall is something that we've also um, uh, advocated against. I see. And with all these groups in mind, um, what kind of dynamics, <clears throat> um, uh, what are the dynamics like in these organizations? Um, what kind of culture do they foster? Um, they, uh, what I like is they try to be, um, they, or they aim to be inclusive. Um, you know, they, they want to grow, uh, further their mission, whether it's advocating for immigrant rights, stopping the border wall, um, protecting our river and its environment, um, 
they want to further their mission through inclusivity. You know, this is this is our mission. This is who we are, and this is why you should care about you know X, Y, and Z. Um, this is how you could join us. Um, and each group finds its own way to be creative, whether it's through a brunch, um, well before pre-COVID or brunch, whether it's through an annual meeting, whether it's through artivism with the coalition. I know downtown we did the whole uh, defund the wall, fund our future uh, in front of the, the courthouse. Um, so through artivism projects, uh, just ways to involve the community, like, you know, uh, through our messaging, you know, we're aware, we're aware that we're a bilingual city. So, you know, reach out to both our English and Spanish and bilingual speaking audience and just uh, uh, help our group grow. But at the same time, uh, uh, I like to say I empower people because it's, it's not like just, we'll come show up Saturday from 11 to one and volunteer and okay, thank you, bye. No, it's more like, you know, learn who we are and how you could be a part of it that way you you know when you go home or when you go to work you could also become an advocate for for our cause and that that you know that's fascinating um because in laredo um i grew up in laredo and i don't remember much activism around me mm -hmm. um you know how do you feel as an activist uh in in laredo um it, yeah and i noticed that uh, uh, sometime this year or late last year i mean how it just Again, the last few years, it, it's grown like these organizations, these groups, and oh yeah, more. You have, uh, I believe it's I may mispronounce it, so you know, if, if, uh, the Candy. I think the Candy Collective, you know, which is more humanitarian. You have the Red Wing, which is more, you know, building community through their own approach. Uh, you know, you have other groups. You know, you have the Brahma Race, which I'm a member of. You know, also you know, emerging. So you have all these group of uh, people. Uh, uh, diverse with different backgrounds, um, you know, wanting to, with their own mission, wanting to improve Laredo and bring change. And I think, I would like to think each one uh, played a role, uh, even though that's not their their primary goal, but in increasing our voter turnout in game. Because if you get people active uh, with immigrant rights, with uh, helping the homeless, you know, I think eventually that form of activism would trickle down to political activism and voting. Very true. And um, who is involved with uh, the, in these activist groups? Uh, like, what are the demographics? Whether it's like social class, um, education, <clears throat> and so forth. Um, it's it's people of all diverse. Uh, I mean, it depends which group you're looking at. For example, Laredo, Laredo Immigrant Alliance. I mean, you have uh, people with DACA, people for like myself for for U.S. citizens. Um, you have people who are teachers, uh, people who work in, uh, you know, other uh, industries. Um, the Ukraine International Study Center, you have, it's very diverse as far as having engineers, uh, educators, uh, restaurant owners, um, uh, and so on, uh, uh, accountants. Um, so, and then you have the uh, groups that are more, uh, Red Wing, which I, I would say, for example, other groups are more like uh, youth-led. Um, you know, Move Texas is another one. You know, uh, that's more youth-led as well. So each group has its own different different makeup, um, and you try to to be inclusive, um, regardless of you know, you don't be like, oh, we're our range is twenty to thirty, so if you don't make make the cuts, so you can't join. You know, regardless of of, of the the core group, I guess the core group. You know, even if the core group is youth-led or the core group core group is comes from a, a higher social income status, let's say. Um, the good thing is, to my knowledge, the groups are still inclusive of everybody, you know. They're not like, well, you know, you don't earn this much money or well, you're a little bit too old for us. Like, you know, they're still being, you know, as long as you want to help their further their mission, you know, uh, they're pretty inclusive. That's awesome. I'm glad it's multi-generational effort going on. Mm -hmm. Um, to get into it a, a little bit, you mentioned the Brown Berets. I, I would like to hear about that. So the Brown Berets, uh, try to my best. Of course, they were they started back in the day, the 60s, 70s. <clears throat> They're like the Black Panthers, you know, but you know more for the uh, the Chicanos, the Hispanics, Mexican Americans. Um, and they have over time, you know, they were from a violent to currently now we we do our best to be more of a nonviolent uh, group uh, through nonviolent actions. Um, 
and they have just like with other groups they have different uh um groups and chapters across the nation and david gomez uh started one maybe going on two two and a half years ago here in uh, maybe even three years ago here in webb county and through Laredo Immigrant Alliance, uh, through another event, I, I met him, we were collaborating. Eventually, you know, I got involved with the Brown Berets. Um, and they're, they're it's, it's about maybe eight of us so far. Um, uh, our goal is just to help out in, in any way we can. Um, whatever else, whatever uplifts and empowers our people, our, you know, our, our Mexicanos, um, you know, that's our goal. I know for, this will be the third year Brown Race and Laredo Immigrant Alliance collaborate on the Angel Tree program, which is a program that gives um, toys to kids whose parents are in prison. Um, so this will be the third year. I think this year we're partnering enough to give out about 100, 105 toys to kids. Um, I know they've participated in the marches, like the Cesar Chavez March. They Every year they help, you know, with the carry the the flag be the flag bearers, you know, and, and, and pride security and all that. Um, so it's the same thing that helps the community. They help out with the homeless. I know, I believe it was, uh, I forget what group of was a collaboration. Every January, they, would, they do a homeless count um, to see how much funding uh, we get from the state for the homeless population to help them. So we do a homeless count, um, and I know they hooked out with that homeless count as well to serve. You know, we just go around town and break out into groups, and and you just ask uh, surveys. You survey the homeless population and see what their needs are. You know, all these groups that you're involved with are very fascinating. Um, I want to get into more like how you feel um, and what pushes you to do this. I guess specifically, you know, what pushed you to do want to do this activism? Um, I. Uh, yeah, it, well, it's finding the time first off, and and <laughs> and balancing, you know, balancing, you know, uh, every group balancing that, and still your family life, um, and your work, um, you know, finding that right balance. Uh, of course, a few nights of staying up late or waking up early or multitasking as best as you can. <clears throat> but at least the ones I'm involved in, or the ones I I help support through sharing their events. It's just groups that I believe in what they're doing and their costs, um, because I think it either affects me, affects my family, affects my friends. Um, I'll give you an example. The Alzheimer's Association has a, uh, I think this was our fifth walk here, the Ready to Walk to End Alzheimer's, has to run the committee. Uh, of course, I don't have uh, Alzheimer's. Um, um, uh, neither does anyone in my, in my uh, close family, um, but uh, my wife, uh, her grandma has dementia. My friends have had people with Alzheimer's. Uh, and now the people who are in the committee, now I consider them my friends and they've had people who have Alzheimer's or during the past few years have uh, passed away to Alzheimer's. Um, but the reason I help them out, even though I don't have directly, because indirectly, I think it's a horrible disease and I think we need to find a cure for it. So it's something that I try to make the time for and help out in any capacity, whether it's helping volunteers, helping sign people up. Um, you know, it's something that I try to further their mission. So each group I'm involved in, whether it was involved for just one year or still being involved going on 10 years like risk, it's because um, I believe in their mission and bringing change to whatever it is they want to bring change to. Thank you for sharing that. You know, that's powerful, uh, you know, using empathy. It doesn't need to be in your own home mm -hmm. for you to feel why you need to be there. So, yeah, I think, I think with every, um, with every, whether it's in the workplace, in your family, I think the two key words are to be, to have empathy and to be inclusive. Uh, you know, if you're inclusive of people and if you're empathetic, I think you go a long way and I think it'll help you grow as a person and if you're involved in a group, I hope your group grow because that energy is going to carry, you know, the people are going to see, well, oh, that group doesn't just use, use you like, oh, show up to my event and I don't care about y'all, you. you know, if they see that you're actually empathetic for the cost and being inclusive and want to include people in, in your cost, then that could go a long way. And how does this energy and this activism <clears throat> transfer onto your career? Um, does it impact it in any way? Um, 
It does. I mean, it helps, um, you know, uh, I bring uh, some of the people I meet in my network now, my expanding, growing network every, every day. Um, you know, I bring them into the after school program. You know, uh, if if you're like risk, um, for example, uh, we're doing these virtual camps, and I asked I asked them, hey, would you guys want to talk to the kids about the river and stuff? And they said, sure. You know, um, um, through another group, uh, La Muy Muy, which is a group of uh, DJs uh, here in Laredo. Uh, that I met through the group, you know, through events, I asked one of them, like, hey, would you like to, you know, participate and do some of the kids? And like, sure. Um, and then, of course, that uh, it's, it, it uh, beats each other. The leadership skills I've gained, the communication skills I've gained, uh, planning, um, communication, event planning, uh, being detail-oriented, uh, whether it's been in work and why doing at work, taking it to my community endeavors or vice versa, so I've learned my community endeavors, take it to my workplace. So it, it's uh, it's benefited both ways. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, the role you take on in your community, um, you know, it's in the, in the classroom in a sense and also, you know, in the community. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for sharing that perspective and getting back into, uh, you know, the way you feel and the way, you know, this energy, energy transfers into your activism. I want to talk a little bit about the wall and, you know, that's like a big ongoing conversation with mm -hmm. Trumpism and uh, the, the building and the construction of the wall. Um, what does it symbolize for you? The, the wall? Uh, um, yes. Um, well, I see it as, um, um, more people say racist and it could be racist by I say more as someone who doesn't live on the border dictating hey this is what's good for you guys this 30 foot structure that's going to cost billions of dollars millions per mile um this is what this is what your community needs for this issue instead of addressing you know well maybe instead of these billions or these millions Let's put in education along the border. Let's put in healthcare jobs along the border. Let's put in, um, you know, raising the minimum wage. You know, let's put in other areas <clears throat> that the border needs. Uh, what I would say are actual national emergencies. You know, um, but instead we're making this false narrative that this is a national emergency and we need to spend these billions of dollars to build this third foot structure, it's gonna go through neighborhoods, you know, and I see it just like, um, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, but yeah, like dictating, like, you know, someone from that's not from the border dictating to us what's good for us. Um, and you have people, you know, you could argue, to, yes, but some agents, you know, are, are for it, but, you know, those agents don't speak for us, you know, don't, they don't speak for all of Webb County, don't speak for everybody on the border. So to just listen to one party and not listen to all parties involved, you know, have you listened to educators? Have you listened to health care workers? Have you listened to families on the board? Have you listened to the youth? You know, did they want this or you just took, you know, what one party said and ran with it? Um, and of course, it's self-interested. I mean, who benefits? You know, who are the developers that are benefiting from the wall? Um, who are these contracts going to? So like I always just follow the money. Uh, I may be wrong again, but then they, uh, I believe it was at Steve Bannon that recently uh, was, was uh, there, were, there was like a GoFundMe or something where people were giving for the wall, but it was actually pocketing that money. So, you know, just like where those followed the money. Yeah, you know, it's a national issue for a small community in <clears> that <throat> sense that like it, there's such a huge focus, but the impact is much bigger than like any most of these people will ever know. Mm -hmm. And, um, what have you seen in your, and learned in your time in Laredo that uh, you feel that um, the wall deserves opposition? Um, again, it, it's it's a, it's a it's a place that um, uh, it's growing. Uh, it's a, you know uh, for family place for families for work, um, and I think bringing a wall and building a wall would just send us back, you know, having to drive by and see that every day, um, having to, you know, be known for that, having to be the number one inland, inland port, number one port, you know, in the country, having to, you know, have commerce go through that. 
Um, and and having it be known, you know, that the border has this, and again, we, we put so much money into it, and, you know, it, it's not, I would dare say, and then you're gonna see this, it's not as effective, we didn't meet its goals. So what are you gonna do? Oh, well, it didn't stop immigration, so let's just tear it down. And how much is that gonna cost? Um, so I think that's a, and that's what people need to need to realize, you know, the 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 other side, you know, um, and think think deeper when you say, you know, just build the wall, you know. Um, well, think beyond that. Think build the wall. What, what does building the wall mean? What's that entail? And what comes with that? Yeah, a little oversimplified, you know, for such mm -hmm. a very very detailed and pressing issue for the community. And um, you mentioned uh, defund the wall mural. Um, I know some events uh, went down with uh, with that mural. I, I would like to hear that from you in detail. Yeah, yeah so we had, um, in, 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 over the summer, we came up with the idea of the coalition, uh, No Border Walk Coalition, to do uh, across the courthouse because we had uh, some people in the coalition had some um, uh, uh, law, lawsuits uh, uh, speaking up against the wall. So that's why we picked the courthouse. And we're gonna do the defund the wall uh, message in, in, in yellow letters, you know, we're gonna bring in the community again, you know, uh, who are going to come out here painted. It was led by some great artists, uh, Tony Briones and Shady Laron and, you know, Brenna De Carina and others who, who um, um, they took the lead and ran with it as far as the planning goes. And we don't, you know, of course you have to the letters and the type of paint to use, you know, we don't wanna mess up the street. Um, and it was just to spread the message, you know, to the rest of Web County and the state and the nation, you know. And I'm glad it got picked up and got attention as far as, you know, we don't want this. And then in addition, um, not just defund the wall, but we added the message fund our future, which goes back to, again, all that money, you know, that you're proposing for the wall instead invested in this, invested in education, invested in jobs invested in um, health care, invested in child services, um, invested in our roads, um, invested in uh, hiring more teachers, invested in, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in our parks, um, in our river, in our water source um, for generations to come. So um, it was pretty big. Uh, we had for sure over 100 volunteers show up over the course of a weekend. We were going to plan it for three or four days, but we had a huge turnout that we were done like in about half the time that we expected. Um, and again, it was because it was a lot went into the planning um, and not just the planning, but then a lot of interest from the community to, to want to participate and take part. And it was great to see on social media, people taking pictures on it, you know, during the making, once it was done. And then after like still like a week later, people still taking pictures or videos and posting it um, as well. So it was very uplifting to see that, um, to see us come together for that. And um, did this initiative meet, uh, meet any backlash in the city? Yes, of course. I mean, you have, again, the people who are for the wall, um, seeing it as, you know, a waste of time. What's the point? The walls are gonna come. You're just wasting your time. You're um, vandalizing the streets. It's graffiti, um, which of course we went through the city council and it got passed and, you know, um, it was self-funded, you know, like who's paying for it, which, you know, it was grassroots, it was people led, you know, it was, it was donations. We had a GoFundMe and people were donating to it. It was saying we got this big, it was a, it was a X amount of check, it was $50,000, you know, go build it. It was, you know, it was all uh, people led. Um, but yeah, you had the backlash, you had, uh, we had to hire again security through our uh, grassroots funds um, for those couple of days because through social media and through word of mouth, you know, people were saying like, once they're done, uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna uh, burn out or do tires, you know, over it, you know, just to send a message. So, um, yeah, so we had to get security and you know, luckily, luckily it's it still stood, you know, I mean, of course, what happens afterwards, you know, we can't control, but at least for those three days, you know, we got to control that and, and have our message be seen. Um, we got some drone footage. Again, some people donated their time and got, got some awesome drone footage of aerial shots of it. So it was pretty good. And I think it'll go down in, uh, I mean, I dare say uh, Laredo Web kind of history, like, you know, this happened, you know, on this day, you know, this day, this happened. Uh, same with in October, we had our uh, Stop the Wall 
Stop the Wall, Rock the Border, a uh, virtual concert with different cities, uh, Laredo, Austin, uh, Arizona, uh, different cities uh, of the four states affected by the wall and they participate different bands, you know, it's a three, four hour concert. Um, I want the message of, you know, stopping the wall and going out to vote, getting out the vote. How did that virtual uh, event turn out? Uh, did you get to participate in it? Well, uh, in the planning of it, um, you know, I got to bring on um, Beto Martinez from Grupo Fantasma, and he was a key thing. Like, we brought him into our committee, and, and he was able, uh, since Grupo Fantasma, I mean, they were a Grammy Award winning band. Some of their members are here from Laredo, and <clears throat> his connections, he, he, he brought some awesome bands that participated in, in the concert. And it got, I don't have the numbers with me, I can send them to you later, but it got YouTube views, uh, shares on Facebook, uh, press coverage. So it, it definitely, you know, uh, got the, the message across and it got the audience we wanted to get. And I dare say it, it turned out so well, the production, the quality put forth by uh, Garen Gaitan from Laredo Film Society. Um, the editing and the quality was so good. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's possible, but I mean, I think if there's a way you could submit that to a, a festival or something, I, I think it has a chance of being nominated, you know, and maybe winning. Fascinating. I mean, I hope to hear that it does. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be looking out for that. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> with that in mind, how are activists treated in Laredo? You know, that virtual event sounds exciting, but on the floor, is it that exciting in Laredo for like the citizens? Um, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to assume it's the same in other cities when you're an activist, quote unquote an activist, and you, you speak up for injustices, or what you think are injustices, or what you think, you know, could be improved upon. There's always people are saying, you know, uh, they're wasting their time, or they have nothing better to do, or uh, meet up, they're just, you know, they should be at work, or they should be at school. Um, so you always have that opposition, you know, um, that's trying to put people down and activism down, like, yeah, you should do something better with your time or, or that's not going to change anything like you're wasting your time like standing with a sign or protesting you know what's that going to do or, or calling people what's that going to do like phone banking but you know activism you know it, it's it's not something for the most part that it's like you know in a second like i did it and one hour later okay there's a the change you know it's a constant you know throughout history we've seen you know through uh from slavery from you know when mexicans first arrived here with the chinese as well i mean Every group has faced this adversity. Um, the Irish had adversity and, and changes gradual, um, but it's that consistent, you know, consistent activism and consistent awareness. And, you know, someone has to be willing to take the time to tell people, hey, this is what's happening and this shouldn't be happening. Um, so it's, it's a difficult work as far as physically and mentally. It could take its toll. I know people who are involved in nonprofits and uh, or just volunteer work, and it's 24/7. Go go go! It could be midnight. It could be three in the morning. They're sending texts or still planning or whatever. And, and um, it's, it's very rewarding um, when you see change, but it's also it could be draining, and we have to be mindful to still take care of ourselves because if we don't, then we can't continue the 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 fight, quote unquote. And that's the powerful part of activism. You know, it, it's consistent and it's ongoing. And with consistency in mind, um, how have the groups you were involved with uh, been organizing during the pandemic? What does that look like now? Um, the, um, well, it's gotten a lot more virtual. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, Lloyd Omega Alliance, you know, Risk all of them, like, you know, we've had uh, from virtual board meetings to virtual events like virtual um, um i'm sure you've seen them like the silent auctions virtual silent auctions um um risk it has their annual um 5k but now it's more like a virtual like you do it at your own time alzheimer's the walk you know we would all gather at tammy you like close to a thousand people would gather but now it's like more like a virtual like do it on your own just send us your photo or video um the Red Immigrant Alliance is going to continue the Know Your Rights um, sessions. We're just talking to people about their rights, you know, in case you're detained, in case you're pulled over, in case you're arrested. And we did those, you know, and we would go to people's houses or the park where they feel comfortable, but we would go meet them there. <clears throat> but now we're going to uh, adapt and give, do them virtual. 
um, you know, and if people don't have like a device, we're going to try and get it sponsored or someone to get a device and just maybe drop it off at their house, you know, so they could log on and when they're done, we could go back and pick it up. Um, so it's just adapting to the change, having the uh, more Zoom and Google Meet, uh, you know, conference call, conference calls, so. Yeah, that accommodating of the community, it, it definitely, you know, really helps things continue flowing smoother. And in fact, I would say maybe even like get more people involved. Um, yes, that does happen positive. So it makes it easier, especially when you, when you, for example, I know me, like, you know, especially with the newborn, it helps being at home as far as still, you know, hey, I need to drive to this meeting and come back, you know, but I'm here at the house. Uh, so it helps in that sense. It helps that you could connect um if someone's gonna be like oh i'm gonna be out of town that day i can't be there but well now since it's virtual you know it doesn't matter if that person's out of town so it does have its, its positives yeah and it's fascinating I mean, the way people are still able to connect and make these important changes and initiatives mm -hmm. and um how often do are y'all meeting um in the age of covid um it depends on the on the group but i think for the average i think it's at least once a month yeah once oh, okay. a month we meet, I, you know, and then uh, besides that, you know, constant communication, whether it's WhatsApp, uh, Slack, uh, Messenger, whatever communication we have. I see. And um, I guess if you could go group by group, but um, what are the, the goals in this date and time? You know, uh, Biden was just elected and, you know, they may have shifted the rhetoric or that they may have been um, putting out there and they're organizing. The, the goals? Or you... yeah, yeah, the goals of the groups that you're involved with. Oh, like now that there's going to be a new administration in place? Um, I mean, it, it's just that we just found out Saturday, so we haven't really met. Actually, the coalition, uh, you know, that they overlap. Actually, uh, tonight at 6.30, uh, I don't know if they're still having it. They had a meeting tonight, um, you know, by tell them, hey, I can't make it, but can we post on the notes? But um, tonight they had a meeting uh, to see what the next steps are with the Biden administration. Like now that we know it's Biden, you know, how can we get his attention to, hey, 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 you know, I know you won, but this is still important. You have to cancel this wall. So I'll catch up with the notes tomorrow and see, you know, what was decided upon, you know, or what thoughts are. Uh, Lord Immigrant Alliance, you know, at, we still have to advocate for immigrant rights. Uh, we haven't, we're going to have our meeting soon just to see, you know, what does that look like, you know, now that it's a Biden, you know, um, how can we, you know, uh, make our, our message known? Uh, the Oakland New Transfer Study Center, we're happy in the sense that um, uh, it seems that the Biden administration is going to be a lot more friendly to environmental laws, you know, and, and, and the environment and climate change. More accepting of, of science and, 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 you know, and all that and, and, you know, taking global warming seriously. So being an environmental organization, of course, that's going to be a huge plus for us. Um, um and with the brown berets you know they're going to keep advocating for for mexican american rights alzheimer's you know it'd be nice usually we get some people go to dc to advocate so hopefully now you know there's people from the uh federal level uh his administration they're willing to listen and find a cure for alzheimer's you know maybe uh, i know there's a lot of things right now with COVID and everything but even right now unfortunately you've seen it with alzheimer's for example um uh, you have people in nursing homes and they have Alzheimer's and you can't see your, your, your grandma, your mom, or your dad because of code restrictions. So uh, hopefully I know he's going to have a task force for coronavirus, but hopefully he keeps that in mind, you know, the, the people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and there's other groups, but yeah, but we just found out Saturday. So I'm sure in the next month before January, you know, we'll, we'll meet and, and we'll come up with a plan and as far as to uh, keep furthering our mission. Yeah, that's exciting to see that unfold. And I wanted to get a little bit more into like the border aspect. Um, do any of these groups have connections across the border in Nova Laredo and their perspective? Yes, uh, I know uh, Mario Grande Shad Study Center. Um, we've uh, uh, tried to build uh, networks in Nova Laredo, which again, because of course it takes a financial effort to address the needs of the Rio Grande. So we've tried to meet with uh, uh, groups and people across. Uh, um, I personally haven't gone, but other people on our board um, have been able to attend those meetings and we're trying to uh, build those relationships. 
Um, hopefully now they can it's a new administration. Uh, maybe now they'll be more opening and welcoming. Um, Loreto Immigrant Alliance, who work with Holding Institute and other groups that uh, provide aid uh, to people across. We also work with Otros Dreams and Acción, um, and they provide resources to people that have been deported from the U.S. to Mexico. So we just met with them this year, and we're trying to see how we could collaborate, you know, um, us on the U.S. side and them on the Mexican side. Yeah, that's fascinating because you don't really hear, uh, you don't you really hear about the U.S. side of things. And so mm -hmm. um, getting that perspective and that uh, helping hand definitely changes things up. And um, I would say it's underreported. So that's why I asked. Yes. And um, I, I guess getting more into uh, a little bit on your personal uh, life um, and your career, um, how has your activism impacted uh, that per se? Have you uh, met any backlash from peers or uh leadership or anything like that backlash as far as uh, me being involved with these groups yeah yeah the reason i bring this up is um per se <clears> like um there was a teacher in the rgv who she had like a black lives matter flag in oh her, yes yeah but, no I, i'm pretty uh why well, I, I do my best um you know nobody's perfect but i try to do my best as far as uh different she wouldn't have obviously to my hat would have to have one do i have my organizing hat on or do i have my work hat if I do an interview or something, I do my best, you know, I'm here representing X organization, or I'm here on behalf of, of uh, UIST. So I do my best to, to do that, to separate the two as far as establish like, um, in what capacity I'm, I'm serving that day, or what hat am I wearing. Um, and also be conscious of, you know, uh, what, you know, I still work for a school district, you know, uh, at the end of the day, that's the type of job I have. It's still a school district job. So being aware of, you know, uh, um, uh, like for example, if I do an interview, even if I say I'm on behalf of X group, I, I'm still not gonna say like you know a cuss or like oh you know F the administration, you know like you know you know. Uh, so just being cognizant of that. So I think that's helped. Of course, people at work know you know they're like uh, when you say, oh I saw it on the news, oh I saw you this, you know, and then you get the oh awesome, keep it up to the whole like. Why are you doing that? There's no point, you know. So you get both sides of it um, from your coworkers, and vice versa. When you're organizing, um, you get people who who know you from the school district and what you do with the after school and the kids and our and our youth. Um, but it's just find, finding that balance and being aware and knowing, you know, what quote unquote what hat you you have on for that day and time. Yeah, very true. You know, setting that boundaries uh, for yourself mm -hmm. because. It does get tough uh, breaking, you know, the like the political and the you know working uh, aspect of life. And um, still a little on your career, how has the Trump presidency impacted your career? Um, as far as career, it 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 it, it hasn't. Um, um, and not that much. I mean, I know we work with an after school program, but. I know, you know, he wanted to take away funding from the federal level from after school programs, but our program is self-sustained. So we just rely on the tuition of parents. So we've been fortunate that that didn't affect us and our staff as far as, you know, you know, oh, do have to fear for our jobs now or, or job loss. So we've been fortunate in that sense. Um, um, career, uh, I, we were a little uh, frustrated and bothered with the pandemic, you know, the whole let's open up the schools, let's open up, up, but especially my wife is also a teacher, you know, like, you know, why does he want to open them up and what's our school district going to do, you know, and then, you know, what type of, you know, but look, United ISD was able to, you know, get an exemption or waiver um, <clears throat> based on, you know, the hospitalization rates and other factors in, in, in our area. And we didn't have to go back face to face as fast. And we had to do more of a transition. Um, and they provided us with, you know, the face masks and other things, you know, and, and the social distancing. Um, so we've been fortunate in that sense. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Biden won in the sense that now we have someone uh, who's more understanding of educators. At least it seems that way. Uh, his wife's the first lady's uh, educator. Um, uh, my friends and I weren't fan of the current education secretary, so hopefully now we get someone that's more understanding of you know education and and what it means. Um, 
So hopefully it brings about good change um, and, and we're not quote unquote forced to, to, to go back to, to the workplace and, and unsafe uh, settings. Yeah, thank you for sharing that perspective. <clears throat> I know um, I ask because a lot of people, uh, their careers uh, down to the, you know, even if you're just starting, um, some people were really moved by the Trump admin, but it, it shows itself in different ways. So uh, thank you for sharing. Um, I want to move on, uh, maybe some final thoughts on the digital world. Um, we've been mentioning a lot, like we've been staying connected uh, virtually in the age of COVID and that's how you've been organizing. Um, what was the role of social media in your activism before COVID? Um, before, um, oh, and I do want to say on, on what you said about the, the Trump, you know, going back to, for example, DACA, some of my friends who have DACA, you know, that was a big mental health burden on them, you know, what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. So I do empathize and feel for them, you know, as far as that whole time was going to happen when, when it was finally decided in June, you know, that was a big breath of fresh air for now, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, so sure. Right. Well, now that you bring that up, I wanted to say, um, has Trump's rhetoric uh, polarized the community in any way in that sense? Um, I mean, as, as far as the talking points that, that you hear elsewhere, yes, as far as, you know, um, send them back, do it the right way, taking up our resources, um, all that stuff. Um, so... Yeah, but uh, you know, we 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 try to do our best to to at least the groups I'm involved in. We do our best just to rely on, on data and the facts, not on you know coming up with a uh, uh, baseless accusations. Yeah, that's the important part. It, it always leads back to like the virtual world, you no, know, you know, because um, right now we're relying on the facts on our phones, you know, in real time reporting and you know fact checking and so forth. Um, I guess going back to the question I had asked, uh, what was social media's role in your activism before the pandemic? Um, it was it was mostly just um, like come up with like say a Facebook, come up with a Facebook event or share a flyer kind of thing. Uh, you know, maybe like help amplify this event, like share this event, share this flyer. Um, and now it's been. Uh, uh, since then, it's so been a lot more like, hey, let's go live, let's do a virtual, you know, uh, environment. Um, but before that, it, it was mostly just that, like, um, um, yeah, it, it, it was it was the basic, you know, uh, amplifier event, share event, uh, come up with a flyer, post a flyer, uh, hashtag, what hashtag are we going to come up with, um, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, that community outreach. Um... I wanted to ask uh, because I feel social media in Laredo it definitely takes a different role and um, with the pandemic shifting because everyone's really relying on uh, keeping in touch and I've seen Facebook groups uh, erupting like there's like a, a COVID Laredo support group going on now and um, yes. just noticing that change. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say Juan, I'm, I, I've, I'm all questioned out. Um, what would you like to share uh, or anything you want to ask me? Um. Um, to share? No, um, no. I mean, just thank you for for you know. It, it's good to have people that want to help uh, amplify the people who are doing work along the border, uh, whether it's Laredo or anywhere else. Um, you know, um, uh, and the the change, the growing change along the border. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, I'm I'm grateful for you know where I'm at in my life. Uh, I know the people you know are, are uh, uh, you know can't say the same, but uh, I'm grateful, you know, for my family and good health and everything. Um, and looking back, you know, of course, so uh, it was difficult upbringing and ups and downs like everyone else. Um, but uh, I'm glad that I'm using my uh, privilege and my uh, resources and my capacity to help uh, uplift others and, and, and you know, uh, bring change to, to our needs. And I hope that during my lifetime, you know, my, my daughter and future generations, you know, are able to see some of that change that I and others are working to, to, to bring. I really appreciate you sharing your perspective and, you know, you're very right. Um, the Voces Projects, you know, needs this kind of uh, idea of, you know, what was going on in Laredo during this time. And, you know, through this interview, they'll be able to definitely trace back and maybe ask some more questions in the future. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording um, and then we'll, we'll, finish off, but um, 
just saying once again, it's Monday, November 9th, 2020. And um, I interviewed Juan Livas. My name is Carlo Bird, and I'm ending the interview, uh, the recording.